Welcome back everyone. I'm Gareth with Creative Connors. I'm an automation junkie and I love moving stuff on stage with machines. But once we get it moving, how do we stop it at the right spot before disaster strikes? We could go old school and just use some spike tape. We could use a limit switch. But what if we want something more accurate than spike tape and something more flexible than limit switch? What if we want to be able to program cues with a motion controller and software like Spike Mark 5? We need an encoder. An encoder like this one is a sensor that converts mechanical motion into an electronic signal. We use that signal to measure the speed, distance, and direction that the scenery is moving. Encoders come in different physical housings to mount to your machine or directly to your scenery. This one is hollow bore, and it works well to attach to the rear shaft of a motor like on a chain hoist. Now this one has a solid shaft and it's easy to slap on a sprocket and drive it from the output side of a gear motor. This one has a string and a spring retractor making it easy to attach to a scissor lift. You can just kind of imagine that, right? Inside, it's still a rotary encoder. It's just being spun with the wire spool. Beyond the physical design, encoders also have a few different types of electrical signals that they emit. It breaks down into two major types, incremental, and absolute. Incremental encoder signals transmit instantaneous motion, but they rely on a controller to keep track of the position. Basically, it's just a signal that says, I'm moving forward, watch me, and keep track. Absolute encoders, on the other hand, transmit a signal that describes the position of the encoder shaft exactly. Both of these types have their pros and cons, but today we're going to focus on incremental encoders because they're more prevalent mostly because they're cheaper. When you spin the shaft on an incremental encoder, it generates a series of pulses that turn on and off. There's different ways this can work, but an optical encoder is very common. Inside, there's a clear disk with a series of lines printed around the edge. A light shines through the disc, and then as the disc rotates, the light is interrupted by the lines. A receiver converts the flashing light into electrical pulses. Now this disc has a very fine pitch between the lines. The lines are so close together that it just looks like a gray stripe. It has over a thousand lines around the disc. When describing it, we say the encoder has a resolution of 1,250 pulses per revolution, or PPR. Each time the disk spins one revolution, it will generate 1,250 pulses. You can imagine that a controller could listen to these pulses and count them to get a sense of the distance traveled. It could also clock the time between pulses to determine the speed. So with these simple on-off pulses, we can figure out how far the scenery is moving and at what speed. Easy peasy. But how do we know which direction it's moving? Is it going on stage or off stage? Up or down? That's kind of critical, right? Well, there's an elegantly simple solution. Use two pulse trains or channels that are offset 90 degrees in phase, and then pay attention to the pattern between the two channels. This is known as a quadrature encoder signal because of the 90 degree phase shift. And we call the two channels A and B. And to show you how this works, I've got an encoder here with a very coarse resolution of just 24 PPR. Instead of using a light beam like an optical encoder, it uses 
Hall effect sensors and magnets embedded in a disk to generate the pulse. The method doesn't matter. It's still an incremental encoder that spews out a stream of pulses when it turns. I like using it to demonstrate because the resolution is so low that you can actually see the pulses being generated as the wheel spins. I've got the A and B channels wired up to some jumbo LEDs. And if I move the wheel quickly, you, it almost looks like those lights stay on constantly. But let me slow down so we, we can see what's going on. There's a pattern here. If I start with both lights off and rotate forward, the A light comes on first. If I keep going, then the B light comes on. Now the A light goes off and then the B goes off. Now let's try this in reverse. B comes on first, then A, then B off, then A off. So from any state, we can determine which direction the machine is moving on the next pulse. If both lights were off and then A comes on first, we're moving forward. But if only B is on and then A comes on, now we know we're moving reverse. Pretty neat, right? By using the two channels and watching the state changes between them, a motion controller can determine speed and direction. Because the encoder is only sending the pulse stream, the motion controller needs to keep a counter going to know the position of the machine. If it detects a forward pulse, it adds one to the counter. If it detects a reverse pulse, it subtracts one from the counter. Simple, right? I've wired this up to an Arduino so you can see the pulses up and down. And so as I turn in the forward direction, you can see the pulses going up. If I turn reverse, the pulses go down. Not only is that nifty to know that an incremental encoder uses the A and B signal to determine direction, it is also helpful so you understand how to flip the direction if you need to. Oftentimes on stage, we're really particular about which direction is counting down. Maybe we want the zero position to be in the wings and moving on stage should count positive. Or with flying units, we want zero to be landed on the deck and positive to fly up. Well, what if the machine was rigged the opposite of what we want and forward is moving off stage? Rather than re-rig everything, we can flip the electrical signals around. If I swap the A and B channels on the encoder, If I swap A and B, now when I rotate forward, or I should say when I rotate clockwise, the B channel comes on first and then the A. And if I rotate counterclockwise, the A channel comes on first. Essentially, we've redefined forward to be the other physical movement. Make sure your motor and encoder are in agreement. Motion controllers are really picky about the fact that forward has to count up and reverse has to count down. Which physical direction is forward is up to you and how you wire the motor. But when you jog forward, make sure the encoder count is increasing. And when you jog reverse, it's decreasing. If not, flip your A and B encoder channels. A side benefit of the dual channel signal that's worth mentioning is that for each pulse, we gain four countable states. So a 1024 PPR encoder has 4096 counts per revolution, effectively quadrupling the number of positions we can decode from the pulse stream. There's one more slightly advanced characteristic to mention. We use quadrature encoders that have differential line drivers. The differential line driver added a complementary signal to A and B called A naught and B naught. These complementary signals mirror the primary signals. When A is high, A naught is low. And when 
A is low, A naught is high. Here's a string encoder with differential signals, and you can see the complementary signals working. Why do we use these extra differential signals? It really helps with signal integrity and noise reduction, allowing us to run encoder cables well over 100 feet without fear of interference. Well, you know, less fear. Without a differential signal, an encoder that uses just A and B channels called single-ended should only be run about six feet through a cable. That's not often enough backstage. I bring it up because if you're swapping A and B phases on your encoder to correct the direction, make sure you keep the primary and complementary signals together. If you swap A and B, you also have to swap A naught and B naught. All right, that's enough for today. I hope this helped take out any mystery of incremental encoders. They are simple devices that are impressively useful for automation. If you'd like me to show you how to write that simple Arduino program that can read and count encoder pulses, leave a comment below. I'm happy to share that. Oh, and if you'd like to learn even more, check out my book, The Scenic Automation Handbook. Thanks so much for watching today. See you next time.